Well, indeed, today is an exciting day for us as a church. It's, you know, it's always awesome to look back at what God has done uh, and, and also to look forward uh, to what God is going to do and has been faithful. God is faithful, and he has been faithful, and he will continue to be faithful. And so when I think about uh, 2015, January of 2015, when we planted Connection Church Fidelia, uh, we started uh, at, at part and park in lines in a cabin. Um, and we set up and tore down there, and uh, a few months later, we moved over to the Blue Marquee in Lyons, Georgia, and we set up and tore down uh, there as well, and then a few months later, we moved into STC, and we've been here for about three and a half or four years, and uh, it's been an incredible, it's, it's been an incredible testimony to see God move, and uh, it, it's awesome to think about the future, and uh, you know, the setup and tear down is worth it because of the changed lives uh, that we've seen. And so as we look forward to a building, uh, it's been an incredible process to uh, walk alongside. Uh, we, we hired an architect out of Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, they're called Equip Studio. And uh, what they've done is they've designed a building specifically for us to help us accomplish uh, our mission. You know, at Connection, we're not really interested in extravagant buildings. We're interested in the mission of God. And so we want our building to be a facility that facilitates uh, our mission and what we're trying to do. And I believe uh, that's what we've been able to design. And so it's exciting to look at it, whether it be the auditorium uh, where we've designed it to be very personal. We want it to be, uh, every, instead of being far back like you guys are now and you can hide from me and I can't see you, um, I, I want everybody to be close where you guys can, we can make the gospel personal uh, whether it be the cafe where uh, we can form discipleship relationships. Relationships are a big deal to us. And uh, I want people to know that we're relational from the moment that they walk in uh, to our church. Whether it be the Connection Kids environments where uh, these kids can learn about Christ on a level uh, that they can understand and be in a room where there's not so many kids that they can actually focus on uh, what, what God's trying to do in their life uh, you also saw the Connection Students environment, which is just an incredible, uh, probably the most exciting, in my opinion, part of the building will be uh, the student environment, which will be a place where they'll want to come, and it'll be a place where uh, they can learn about Christ, be raised up and sent out uh, to college for, for the kingdom of God or sent out uh, to the workplace, whatever it is. And so one of the things about being mobile is you never really feel like you have a home, you know? And so when we build this building, that's what we designed it to be, is a home base for us to launch out into this community uh, to, to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when you see the building, I don't want you to think about the building. There's also some awesome things about having a facility. What I want you to be thinking about are the lives that are going to be transformed because that's what we're given to. We're not given to a building. We're given to the mission of God. The 1-8 Project has been all about elevating our generosity for the mission of God. When you think about a facility, this is something that's going to last beyond even us, right? So after we're long and dead, this thing will still be here. Think about the legacy of your children being raised up here and planted out and the lives, hundreds of lives that will be transformed over and over uh, out here. And so anytime you talk about a building, there's always three questions that you got to kind of think about. You know, the first one is, what is the building going to look like? Well, that, you guys have seen kind of pictures here. If you go to the uh, website, ccvidea.com backslash 18 project, uh, there's a slower roll of the footage. Again, this may not be exactly what the building looks like, uh, but it is what we've designed and what we hope uh, to get. The second question is how much will it cost, right? That's a great question, and there's a lot of variables. So I'm going to give you a range of kind of if we built today, it would be between 4 and $6 million dollars. Uh, but building prices have skyrocketed, right? So a lot can happen in two years. And so whether it be supply cost or uh, how much the general contractor can do price per square foot, there's a ton of different variables uh, that go into that stuff. And so if we, uh, kind of the third question is how long will it take, right? So not only how much does it cost, how long is it going to take? When are we breaking ground? Uh, when will we be in the building? Well, the building process takes about uh, 10 to 12 months, 8 to 12 months, most people uh, say. And so it takes 20% of the total cost of the building to break ground on the building, right? So uh, as we are right now, we have about um, 154 people committed to give to the 1-8 Project back in November. 
Um, 124 of those people have, have given to the 1-8 project, right? So there's a few that committed that haven't given, but we have 124 people that are giving consistently. Uh, right now, we're bringing in about $5,000 a week. So if you do the math on that, uh, we did a jump start back in November, and then 5000 a week since then. Uh, you can tell we, we're on pace to have about $800,000 in November of 2022, which is good, but I think there's a, a few more steps that we need to take as a church uh, to, to get to exactly uh, where we want to be. So I want to set three goals before you today. For us as a church, this is kind of family business. If you're a first-time guest, don't feel pressure uh, to give. I will never tell you as your pastor uh, that you have to do something. I want you to listen to God and do what he tells you to do. Listen, we're a family. We take steps together. I would never ask you to do something that, I want, that me and my family are not willing to do uh, right there along with you. And so the three goals I want to put before you today is I realize there's people in the room today that you've not committed to the 1-8 project. You're new. Maybe you're new to the church. Maybe uh, you haven't heard anything about it. Uh, maybe you just didn't have the resources to commit back in November. Uh, I, my goal is that we would have 25 new people uh, commit to the 1-8 project on October 4th, which is the day that we're going to kind of have a 1-8 day where everybody commits uh, to it or raises their commitment. And so if you're here and you're new and you say, man, I'm not a part of the 1-8 project, uh, you know our church, I've called, called you guys this all the time, we're scrappy, right? So we don't really have anybody that's going to cut a check for $2 million to pay for the building. And I love that because it takes all of us. And so throughout the 1-8 project, you've heard me say, it's gonna take 100% participation. Whether you have a lot of money or don't have a lot, listen, all of us have a part to play and all of us can play a part. And when you walk in that, 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 that building or uh, when you think about Connection Church Athens or when you think about the land that we've been able to purchase as a church, you were a part of that. And so my goal is that we would have 25 new people commit. So maybe that's you. The second goal, uh, is that we would have the people uh, that are already committed, right? So we've got 154 people that have already committed. Uh, my goal is that I think we need to increase that a little bit, right? And so uh, my wife and I have committed to give uh, $100 a week to the 1-8 Project. The average commitment in our church is $50 a week with the commitments that we've had. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is just pray about increasing your commitment by 15%, right? So for me and Kate, think about it. We give 100 a week, so we would just give 115 a week. That's me not going to Starbucks one day, and I can put that towards, uh, no offense, towards Starbucks. I know we got some workers in here. Um, so uh, just putting a little bit more effort there to get us to where we want to be. So maybe that's you. You've made a commitment, and you say, Billy, God's blessed us over the past eight months, or man, we're at a place where we're willing to sacrifice and step out with you and increase our commitment by 15%. Uh, listen, maybe you want to do more. That's up to you. Just pray and ask the Lord uh, to do that. And then the third and final thing is on October 4th, uh, we are going to have a 1-8 Sunday. And what I mean by that is our whole offering on October 4th will go towards the 1-8 project. And so one of the ways that we were able to jump out in front and raise $300,000 in the middle of a pandemic, which is absolutely incredible, was the jump start that we did off the front where people uh, were willing to say, hey, God's blessed us. We want to give a big chunk up front. And so we're going to have another day on October 4th where I'm going to ask uh, you to pray about uh, save a little bit of money, and we're all going to throw it down together and see just what we can do. I'm going to set the goal at 50000 right? Why am I setting at 50000 Well, I kind of prayed, and that's the, Lord, the number the Lord had really put on my heart. But also, um, we average about a $17,000 offering every week, right? So that's great. That's praise God for you guys. That's incredible for us as a church. But I think if everybody's willing to step up and maybe give double what you're giving now, we could raise and, and, and cut out a big chunk of it. And I think if we do that this year and next year, man, we could really uh, break ground. Because I know you guys are ready to get into the building as much as I am, right? And so uh, as we think about that, we're in control of that. That's something that we can control. And, uh, but it's going to take us sacrificing and praying and asking God uh, to, 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 to help us take steps uh, to get to where we want to go. So I want to pray for us as we get started, but that's kind of the info. If you have any more questions on that, uh, you can go by the tent outside. We'd love to answer it. Again, uh, the 1-8 website, ccvadea.com backslash 1-8 project is all the information will be there for you. So let's pray. Father, thank you for today. God, what an exciting day. Father, you, you, you've been faithful to us for so long. 
And God, we just, as we look to the future and Lord, look to what you want to do in this community. God, I'm so excited to think about the, the piece of property that you've given us and the neighborhoods that we're going to be able to engage with there and the diversity and Lord, just uh, the, the just ability to reach lost people. Father, uh, I'm reminded every time I go out into our community, God, there's people uh, that are lost. God, they think they're saved, but they're not. God, people that know they're lost and they're, and they're lost. And Lord, I pray that you would use us as a church to reach them. Father, I pray that this building would be a step towards uh, planting our roots here in Vidalia and transforming this community for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So be with us today as we dig into your word. Father, I pray you'd speak to our hearts. God, lead us and guide us. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you got your Bible, I want to open up to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 is where we'll be. We've been in this series called Blueprint. Uh, we're finishing it up this morning where we've been looking at the book of 1 Timothy uh, and looking at God's design for the church. 1 Timothy is a book written by Paul to a pastor of a church. Uh, and, and Paul's writing to him saying, hey, this is what the church uh, should look like. These are things that this is how we should behave uh, in the church. So we've looked at everything from the message of God's church, which is the gospel, all the way to what does godly leadership look like in the church, the importance of God's word in the church. And today we're going to look at what the church's mindset should be uh, towards money. So let's, uh, let's, let's jump in in verse 6 right here and uh, follow along with me. It'll be on the screen if you don't have your Bible. Uh, verse 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, then we will be content with that. Verse 9, those who want to get rich, they fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Verse 11, but you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and endurance and gentleness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich, verse 17, in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So the last thing that Paul addresses with Timothy is this idea of kind of a godly view of money. Now, here's the thing I understand. Anytime we read the Bible and it talks about money, anytime a preacher steps up here and begins to preach on money, it gets uncomfortable. Right, I told the first, it's like, man, boom, here's the bill, and everybody's excited. I talk about money, and it kind of cuts the air out of the room. But listen to me. I, I, when I first became a preacher, it was hard for me to preach about money because I felt like I was angry, is that now I see finances and your view of money as a discipleship thing, right? So here's the thing that you got to understand. God loves you. God cares for you. God wants to be your God. He wants you to follow him. He wants to lead you in every area of your life. One of the areas that he wants to lead you in is this area of finances. But there's not an area of our lives that we hold on to more tightly because finances give us this false assured assurance of, of control and we, we just feel like it's ours and nobody can touch it. But listen, as I preach this text and you hear from God and what he has to say about money, 
Don't feel guilty. Don't feel shame. Don't feel like you got to grab on to what you have, but allow the God of the universe, the one we just sang to, that, bi- that bi- we build our life on, the rock that we build our life on, the one that reigns above it all, that gives you what you have, takes away. This is the God that wants to help you. So I say this, I don't preach on money to get something from you. I preach on money because I want something for you. Does that make sense? And so there's a big difference. People get uncomfortable. Listen, and I want you to understand that God wants to grow us in this area of our life. So I want you to write this down. God's desire is for us to be content and generous people. In God's church, God's desire is for us to be content and to be generous people. Why? Because the gospel produces these two things in our life. Listen, this is what the characteristics of the church should be. We should be content and we should be generous. Why? Because as we experience the gospel and who God is and we begin to follow Christ, these are things that he produces in us that begin to overflow through us. But we will never become content and generous if we put our hope in money. So you see Paul encouraging Timothy, he says, don't put your hope in money. Why? Because God has this, he's he's designed his church to to be his visible, tangible impression to this world. So when God, when people outside the church look at the church or people inside the church experience the church, they're experiencing God himself. Well, when you think about generosity, generosity, and you think about contentment and, and understanding an identity. God was sure of who he was. He knew exactly who he was, not because of the, what the world said about him, but because of what God said about him. And God was the most generous person to ever walk the face of the earth, for God so loved the world that he gave, right? He, he modeled generosity his whole life, as Andrew read in Philippians 2, was laying himself down for the sake of other people, which is what generosity is. And so if we want to become content and generous people, we have to understand that that will not happen if we put our hope in money. And one thing before I go into my points, money is never a bad thing in the Bible. You understand that? Money, God never says money is evil. A lot of people misquote the scripture in here. Well, money's the root of all evil, isn't it? That, that isn't what God's word said. What does it say? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Why does it say that? Because money's not the issue. Who's the issue? We're the issue, right? Sin in us, our desire for money, what, how we twist money up and, and the desire for money and what we do with our money, the sin in us is always the issue, right? So no, don't hear, as you hear me preach about money, that money is a bad thing. It's not. It's a good gift from God to be used for his kingdom. But what God wants to work on in us is how we view money. What is our worldview when it comes to money? Do we think about it the way God does or have we been raised a certain way to think about it this way or we look into it to give us something that it was never designed to give? So I wanna point out three things to you from this passage that I think will encourage us and really grow us this morning. The first one is this, do not put your hope in money. Do not put your hope in money. A simple statement, why not? Well, because here's the thing. It's so promising. Is there anything else that has the ability that we can just look to it and say, man, my life would be better if I had more money? It just has that effect. And we live in a world, a culture that tells us certain things about money. It teaches us that we can buy happiness. But it's not true. Right? It teaches us that we can buy happiness. If I could just have this or buy this or fill my life with this, I would be more happy. Then we add social media on top of that where we get to see other people buying things and they're smiling. And of course, social media doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't show the debt that they're going in to buy this. All we see is the happy face when they come up with this. And we're like, man, if I want to be happy, I have to get this or I have to do that or I have to buy these things. Money tells us that, that we're successful. You know, I think about great athletes. One of the things that great athletes are rewarded with are money, right? Patrick Mahomes, quarterback, Kansas City Chiefs, won the Super Bowl last year, got a 10-year deal for $500 million. I can't even imagine what $500 million would be like. But 
in, in his eyes, he's arrived, right? In our eyes, it's like, oh my gosh, he's the most successful quarterback ever. The guy's won one Super Bowl, right? He's done a lot, but not a whole lot. And so when we look at culture, a lot of times we base our identity and our success off of how much money we make, but that's not what God's word has to say. Another thing we look to money for is security and safety, right? We think of money as the means for our family to be secure and safe. So we begin to look to money to provide what God wants to provide in our life, which is provision and safety. So instead of looking to God and depending on God to be our provider, we look to money and begin to worship it. So in our world, money equals success, significance, and security. That's a big deal. There's really nothing else in our world that does that. And that's why I believe Jesus came and talked more about money than he talked about anything else because he knew money was a great indicator of our heart. And he knew money was a trap that we would walk into and begin to look to it for things that weren't meant to provide in his eyes. So what we conclude is that if money equals success, significance, and security, from our experience, we say, well, if I have money, I'll be happy. So what happens is we jump into this rat race of money and material possessions, and we begin to give our life to it. You know, when I was in high school, uh, I think it was high school, maybe middle school, um, there was this rapper that, that came out. His name was 50 Cent. Um, and, and his motto was, get rich or die trying, right? I got any 50 Cent fans? Let's throw back real quick. Um, so show my age. And, and what happened is, as a kid, I remember listening to his music. I mean, it was, it was you know, I was at a time in my life where I, I liked that kind of music, and, um, you know, it was great. I listened to it, and, and what happened is I wasn't understanding the truth that it was putting into my mind. I say the truth, the lies that it was putting into my mind of, hey, you need to give everything you got to get rich, because if you get rich, you'll be happy. So you need to jump into this rat race of trying to get rich and trying to get all these possessions, because ultimately that defines who you are. That defines your happiness, and that defines uh, what your friends think of you, right? And so I compare it to this. How many of you guys have ever seen uh, in a pet store a rat? You know, you see a rat or a hamster or whatever it is, and you see this wheel in their cage, and, and the wheel just spins around and round and round, but when the rat gets in there, it doesn't go anywhere. And so what happens is when we begin to pursue money and possessions, we're like a little hamster. We jump on this wheel and we just spin round and round and round and we never get anywhere because money's not designed to do, to do that in our lives. It's not designed to give us an identity. It's not designed to be fulfillment. It overpromises and under delivers. I want you to hear, however, how Jesus talks about money. I'm gonna read a bunch of scriptures to you. Don't try to, they won't be on the screen. I want you to just write them down and maybe go back to them later and look at them. But here's what Jesus taught on money. It's very different from what the world teaches you and I. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Jesus tells his disciples, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. Okay, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, against wanting things that you don't have. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. If you're looking for life and you're looking for it in an abundance of possessions, Jesus says it's not there. Ecclesiastes 5.10, this is a guy by the name of Solomon who was the wealthiest man that we get a picture of in the entire Bible. Holy Spirit spoke through him in Ecclesiastes 5.10 and said this, Whoever loves money will never have enough. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. It's like you're chasing after the wind. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. 28, Solomon again. He warns that he who trusts in riches will fall. It says it's like building your life on sand. You put your trust in riches and it will fall. May not be tomorrow, but it'll be sometime. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus himself, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
says it doesn't make any sense to build up this material possessions and all this wealth on earth when, when literally your treasure, it one day will just dissolve and you're going to another world. So live for the world that you're going to, not for the world that you're in. Matthew 19, 23 through 24, Jesus again says to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. He says this right after he had sent away the rich young ruler. Many of you know that story where he comes and he wants to follow Jesus and Jesus knows that he's a man who worships money. And he says, listen, if you want to follow me, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and then come and follow me. What is Jesus doing? Do we have to sell everything we have and give it to the poor to follow Christ? No, he's uncovering what this guy worships, his idol and says, you can't worship money and me. So he says it's very hard for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God because it's very hard to walk away from the love of money. There's not one heart in this room today, including myself, that doesn't have this sin inside of us. And what money does that really, nothing else that I know of does this. It blinds us to our need for God. It really just covers our eyes because we feel like we can self-sufficiently walk through life and not need anything because money can give us everything that we need. And one day we wake up and realize it can't. Only God can do that. And then Paul goes on in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, which is the text where we're in now, and he almost addresses it from two different angles. One are those who don't think they have a lot of money, and he addresses them, and then he addresses those of us that would say, well, we're pretty wealthy, we're pretty well off. Verse Timothy 6, 9 and 10, those without money, Paul says this, those who want to get rich, they fall into temptation and a trap. I want you to circle that word. They fall into a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and they pierce themselves with many griefs. And then he goes on in, in verses 17 through 19 and he addresses those with money. The catch here is that we in America are the rich of the world. You realize most people in our, in our world live on less than $2 a day. Most of us make at least $2 a day, so it puts us in the top 10. Uh, I think it's $25,000 a year puts you in the top 10% of the world in wealth. That's all of us, pretty much. Um, and here's what his command is to us, the wealthy. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. Well, he relates wealth and arrogant. Why? Because money is power. Right? Money makes us think we're, uh, unpen- you know, nothing can come in. Nobody can teach us. If we got money, we're successful, and it blinds us to anything because we think we're successful. He says uh, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Again, verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for themselves treasure as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I want you to write this down. Jesus wants us to know that money is a trap. It's a trap. The love of money lures us in, and it promises things that it cannot deliver. It overpromises and it underdelivers. It promises you satisfaction. It promises you hope. It promises you self-sufficiency and control. It promises you comfort. It promises you safety and security for your family. The only problem is it's a terrible God because what you look to for satisfaction and hope and control and self-sufficiency and comfort and safety and security is your God. But money is a terrible God. It's uncertain. It's unstable. It can be taken away at any second. It will demand more from you than you can give it. It will take you places you never wanted to go, and it'll leave you unfulfilled and unsatisfied. It's a terrible foundation to build your life on, a terrible foundation to build your life on. Again, I want to remind you, money is never the problem. Don't hear me saying that money is the issue. Money's a good thing. The issue is us. 
Our sinful desires twist money and put it into places in our life where it was never designed to be. Tim Keller, one of my favorite pastors, says, this, says it this way about this passage. He says, listen, the love of money is a trap because we imagine that wealth is the way that we can feel safe and secure in this world. But money is not inherently evil, but it is often dangerous because it has power to blind us to spiritual reality. When a person becomes financially successful, they start to feel that they are successful in all areas and that they can easily become blinded to their own sin. Also, the love of money is a very unique sin because few people can see greed in themselves. You know, I've, I've heard a lot as a pastor. I've had a lot of people come to me uh, for a lot of things for help. Uh, but one of the things somebody has never come to me with is, Billy, I'm greedy. I need you to help me deal with this sin of greed. Why? Because it blinds us. And a lot of times we don't like to admit this sin. Instead, we falsely believe, this is Tim Keller still, believe that luxuries are necessities. And finally, money deceives us by telling us that it can bring us security and this makes us unwilling to part with our money. It is only when we see the real security we have in Christ that we can relinquish the deceitful security offered by money. So you say, dang, Billy, that, that's tough, man. Like, how do I know if I'm falling, if money's a trap and it's just luring me in, then how do I know if I've fallen into the trap? Because all of us at some point in our life, maybe now, maybe later, maybe before, have fallen into this trap. How do we know? Well, I'd ask you one question. Are you looking to money to give you what only God can give you? So listen to that again. Are you looking to money to give you what only God was designed to give you? Here's the way I want you to think about it. Every person in this room, every person that was created by God, which is all of us, was created with a hole in our hearts, a hole that has no idea what our identity is, so we search for it in the world, a hole that has no fulfillment in it, so we search for it in purpose, and that hole was designed to be filled with one thing. And that's God. That's being connected back to our creator, the only person who knows how we were created. And so what happens is a lot of times we take the cube of money and try to fit it into the circle in our heart and it doesn't work. And so God says, listen, when we begin to look, at, look to money to give us what God can give us, satisfaction, identity, fulfillment, salvation, he says we have begin to put money in a place where it was never designed to be. So you say, Billy, that's pretty tough teaching on money, and I understand it is. So let's get to some good news. How does God want us to view money? As God's church, remember I told you this from the start, he wants us to be content and to be generous. So let's talk about these two things. As God's church, this is not for some of us, this is for all of us. How do we begin to grow into being content and grow into being generous and willing to share? Secondly, be content. But godliness, verse 6, with contentment is great gain. Or a better translation is, but godliness with contentment is true wealth. So true wealth is not having a lot of money. True wealth is godliness. As we begin to grow and know God and begin to become more and more like him, we actually experience true riches. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. The only thing we'll take out of this world is the godliness that we've acquired here through the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, then we should be content with that. So Paul knows that if our hope is in money, we will never be content because money's a rat race, right? He knows, listen, uh, contentment, I want to define it this way, is the ability to be happy or content no matter what your circumstance is. You understand that? So contentment is not something outside of you. It's actually something inside of you. Paul writes about this in the book of Philippians chapter 4, and listen to what he says. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. He was asking him for money. He says, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I'm not asking anybody for money. I've learned to be content. How, Paul? Tell us. Verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. I've been in need. I know what it means to be there. I know what it is to have plenty. I've been wealthy. I've had money. And then he says, I've learned the secret to being content in any and every situation. Well, do share with us the secret to being content, Paul. We want to know. 
whether well-fed or hungry, whether living or in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What has Paul figured out about contentment? He said, contentment only comes from one place, knowing God, knowing that God is with you and walking with him. That's the only place that you'll ever find contentment in this world. He says, when you find that, you find true riches. Paul says, if you think material wealth is the way to be content, you are wrong. If you think this is going to provide you content or buying this or doing this is going to make you content, you are wrong and you have been deceived. A lot of people think if I made a lot more money, then I would like myself more. But actually, making more money has been known to create self-doubt and increase self-doubt. So a lot of people say if I made more money, people would like me or my relationships would get better. But a lot of times more money complicates relationships. A lot of people think if they had more money, then they'd feel safe and secure. But actually, you worry more the more money you have because you have more to lose. And so money promises you these things, but it never delivers. It actually puts more on your shoulders when you begin to look to it for what only God can look to. So listen to me. Being content is about inner peace. It's about what God provides inwardly that nothing externally can shake. Tony Evans, one of my favorite pastors, says it this way. He says, contentment is being at ease where you are and being thankful for what you have. Contentment doesn't mean complacency. Rather, it's learning to be satisfied until God uh, gives you more. Complaining is an empirical proof of discontentment. Listen to that. Complaining is an empirical proof of discontentment. You want to know if you're discontent? Complaining. But if you have contentment, you have inner self-sufficiency in spite of external circumstances. You have that which is truly life, verse 19 says. A lack of contentment will stifle godliness, but content people know that God is acting on their behalf. You know, one of the biggest enemies of contentment in our life is comparison. We quit looking to the provision of God and to trust that God will give us everything that we need exactly when we need it. And we begin to look around to what God's given everybody else. But God doesn't intend for Billy to live so-and-so's life or he doesn't intend for so-and-so to live Billy's life. He blesses Billy with what he needs when he needs it to become who he's called me to become. I get this all the time, Billy, if I had more money then I would tithe. Well, would you? Because the Bible teaches if we're not faithful with what we have, we won't be faithful with more. That's why tithing is a percentage thing. You ever thought about that? So God asks us to tithe to the local church and he'll bless us. Why does he ask us? Well, 10% to a person who makes $100,000 and 10% to a person who makes $25,000, it's the same sacrifice. 10% is 10%. He doesn't say, oh, we all need to give $25,000 to the church. He doesn't say that. He puts a percentage in place to say, Man, hey, are you willing to sacrifice part of your money to God to show that he's the Lord of your life? Are you willing to bring your first? That's the principle of tithing. It's a farming principle where it's as soon as you harvest the crop, you bring the first 10% into the house of God because the first 10% is showing God is first in my life. And so tithing is is a way to show if God is first in our life, right? And people want to argue, well, Billy, tithing ain't in the New Testament now. Well, it is a few times, but to me, grace upped the standard, right? So uh, tithing should be the the floorboard of where we're going. You know, and I don't say that to convict you. I'm just saying if God's first in your life, then we need to begin to embrace the promises of God. He says, if we'll bring, I can't afford not to tithe because God says tithing brings blessing. He'll open the floodgates in Malachi 3.10 and pour down blessing on his people. So this is what the attitude of contentment looks like. What does it look like? Well, I'd say contentment is characterized by a few things. One, it's, it's, it's by gratitude, right? So when we're content, we're thankful for what God has given us. We see that everything I have is a gift from God. So I'm going to be thankful and I'm going to enjoy what he has given me. Right? We, we live in our means. We don't live outside of our means and run up a ton of credit card debt because we believe that God has given us what he's given us to steward effectively. The second way is faithfulness. It's characterized by faithfully stewarding what God's given you. You know, God has specifically entrusted 
each person in this room with what he's given you for a specific purpose. So if he thought you needed a million dollars, he would give you a million dollars. But for some of us, we're not being faithful with what he's given us now, so why would he entrust us with more? We gotta begin to bring our lives into submission to God now and see what God can do. I'm not saying he'll give you a million dollars, but he will bless you in some way. Third and finally, God wants us not to put our hope in money. He wants us to be content. Content is about being inner peace with God and a relationship with God. And then third, he wants us to be generous and willing to share. Verse 17, listen, he says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. You know, God wants us to not fall into the trap of money. He wants us to see money as a tool. That makes sense? A tool for his kingdom. God blesses us so that we can bless other people. That's what he does. Not only he provides for our needs, shelter, food, all that, but also he blesses us to bless others. You know, God doesn't bless us to raise our standard of living. He blesses us to raise our standard of giving, right? That's what, when I, I think this way, I'm just like you. When, when I get a raise or uh, I get some money or somebody blesses us with that, the first thought is, oh man, let me go spend this on myself. But my wife is, is so much more godly than I am. You know, she's like, hey, we need to tithe off of that. We need to, you know, think about, man, is there anybody in our life that, that we need to be helping right now? And I'm like, no, I'm going to buy this hunting thing. You know what I mean? And so, but God wants our first instinct to be, man, why is God blessing us? Who is it in our life that God's blessing us to be a blessing to? How would your generosity change if you began to, to live life this way? God blesses me to bless other people. Listen, when we're no longer controlled by the fear of losing our money, when we're no longer controlled by greed and needing more money, when we trust God to provide and our hearts are right, we're freed up to be the generous, content people that God wants us to be. You see, that's what the love of God does in our hearts. It loosens our grip on the world and it opens our hands for what we have to be used by God. Some of us, our knuckles are white. We're just gripping on to everything we have and trying to control it. And we need to come to the realization that we're not in control anyway. God's in control. And God's asking you to be faithful with what he's given you. He's asking you to be generous because God wants generosity to be the greatest characteristic of his church because generosity is the kingdom of God. So right where you are, I want you to bow your head and ask yourself, what is it that God's trying to speak to you this morning? For some of us, we're in a place where we've put money in a place in our life where God never designed for it to be. Our hope, our savior, our security is in money and we know it. And today God's calling us to turn from sin and turn to him and say, God, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. God, would you step back into the place in my life that only you're designed to be? And that leads us to contentment and it leads us to generosity. For some of us, we've never asked God to be the Lord of our life. Maybe we've uh, asked him to save us, but God doesn't come as Savior without coming as Lord. And so today, maybe we need to surrender our life to Christ and say, Lord, I'm, I've, I've built my life on sand. I'm building my life on all these other things. I want to build my life on you this morning. God's been speaking to your heart. If that's you, you'd say, Billy, that's me. Today's the day. I need to turn to God and I need to be saved. I need to ask him to do a work in my life. I want to build my life on him. If that's you, would you just lift your hand right where you are? You say, Billy, that's me. I want to pray for you. You say, Billy, that's me today. God's speaking to my heart, and I want to build my life on him. Amen. So, God, for the rest of us, Lord, my prayer, God, would you make us into the people that you've called us to be? Father, would you loosen our grip on money? God, would you show us areas of our life where we're looking to possessions for life? And God, would you open our hands to who you've called us to be? God, will we be vessels? Will we see money as a tool to bless others? God, to be used by you. God, will we be faithful stewards of what you've given us? And God, would you use us to transform this community, to transform this world? God, speak to our hearts today. God, give us the courage to take the next steps 
that you've called us to take. Father, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. We'll see you back next week.